This is a uh, running cross-platform PowerShell, and I'm Dave Carroll. Um, I used to be active on Twitter and um, I have a couple other places now. I'm mostly active on LinkedIn and um, GitHub. Not really active there anymore, but I'm <clears throat> starting to get more active. Um, um, pretty anywhere I am, it's going to be uh, the Dave Carroll. Oh, sorry, just the Dave Carroll. Uh, my website is thedavecarroll.com. Uh, it's uh, important to have your branding. Uh, this is one of the things that I could do that I could pretty much do all over, uh, like all the socials that I was dealing with at the time. So, uh, first thing we want to thank the sponsors. If you haven't got out to one of their um, to their booths yet, uh, you should you should do that. They are um, they're the reason why we can do what we do here. Um, I know that. Most people probably use chocolate. Well, we use chocolatey where I work at. Um, and I think we had a PDQ server sometime back. But um, for sure, just go out and, and talk, to the, uh, talk to the sponsors. And um, you know, that way they'll keep on sponsoring us. And we can keep on coming here to this cool place. So <clears throat> who am I? Um, I'm a DevOps engineer by day, uh, PowerShell developer by night. Um, I've um, con contributed to a couple of the chapters in the uh, like the conference book volumes uh, two and three. Um, I've also created a few modules uh, like Posh Events, Posh Group Policy, and um, if anybody remembered Bluebird PS, that was that was mine until it, it died, uh, and. Um, <clears throat> The uh, PS temperature is the, I don't have it in the gallery, but it's a uh, binary module, like a very simple binary module. Uh, it's usually a good way to kind of, if you wanted to see how one of those works, how they're put together, uh, it's got like maybe four or five uh, commands in like one major uh, class. So I've been blogging about PowerShell for about six years. I've been automating with PowerShell for 15. And I've been solving IT problems for nearly 30 years. Um, sometimes that number just astounds me. It doesn't feel like that. But um, that's, that's reality. <clears throat> so uh, one of the things um, <clears throat> that um, I wish I'd had this talk before is uh, Bluebird PS version 1. I shipped it. It was great. It did everything I wanted it to do on my machine. And then uh, some, some guy named Jeff Hicks decided to install it and gave, you know, put in one of, one of my first issues for that. So it's like, yeah, the, uh, the ENV home is not a variable on, uh, uh, like, I guess, on Windows, and, but home, dollar home was. So I didn't do enough testing, and I... I should have done that, but uh, I didn't. I quickly released a 011 uh, to make him and everybody else happy. <clears throat> so um, we're talking today about cross-platform support. Uh, before I really get into that, uh, so who here, <clears throat> who here um, runs PowerShell uh, 7 on, on anything besides Windows? Okay, a good number. Um, anybody still running PowerShell Core? Good job. <laughs> um, how about Power, uh, Windows PowerShell 5.1? Yeah, every, everybody's got to do that, right? <clears throat> um, so uh, my daily driver is a Mac. Um, I do predominantly everything through that. Uh, with the exception of um, any work that I have to do with Windows servers. Um, like, uh, we don't have uh, SSH remoting or anything like that enabled. It's just straight up Windows, you know, Windows PowerShell 5.1. And um, yeah, so I'm not, uh, I'm not super, super great on that. But I, you know, I, I still try to write some of the things that I can run in both Windows PowerShell 5.1 and also uh, PowerShell 7. So uh, the big difference is, you know, I'm sure we all know that PowerShell, uh, Windows PowerShell 5.1 was written in .NET 
framework, and uh, you can only run it on Windows. And the uh, PowerShell 7, it's not PowerShell Core, it's PowerShell 7, uh, it was built on .NET Core, and whenever they changed, whenever .NET changed their name, so did PowerShell, so like .NET 5 and up. And it's uh, cross-platform, it's, uh, it's able to run on, on anything that uh, pretty much .NET is supported on. I think there might be some cases where it may not fully be supported on the others. Um, and it also provides new features like the ternary operator, the, the question mark, so like the, um, where like all the other uh, higher level languages also include that, but you know, it took a while. And uh, condition, null conditionals, and uh, also we now have the uh, for each object pipe um, parallel to help speed things up. <clears throat> um, so we're talking about compatibility. Uh, you can um, you can use the use Windows PowerShell when you're importing a module. Um, that's going to create an implicit uh, remoting session uh, for Windows PowerShell 5.1. And basically, all of the commands are going to be going through that. Uh, if, if I'm, if I remember correctly, I haven't actually used that that much. Again, mostly I'm I'm on on a Mac. Um, and then there's going to, uh, not all Windows specific modules are going to be uh, either available or even functional on Linux and Mac OS, and, and vice versa, uh, just because of the uh, the differences in the the platform. Um, <clears throat> so Windows PowerShell 5.1. Uh, does have access to, you know, obviously all of the .NET frameworks, and some of these, uh, some of those modules could be uh, supported in PowerShell 7 with modifications, maybe without modifications. Um, so, yeah, let's uh, go to the next thing. So, <clears throat> I wanted to see kind of like how many, um, this probably would have been a better place to ask, you know, where you use, uh, what do you use, uh, like where you use PowerShell 7 and things like that. Just a second. <clears throat> so there's a uh, uh, Power BI uh, that the uh, Steve Lee uh, produced several years ago, I think, and I just happened upon it. It's got basically like four pages. Um, so, like in the last 90 days, we're looking at uh, 281 million sessions or million nodes that has run um, the uh, uh, PowerShell 7. Um, that's probably not that surprising, but the 80 million kind of maybe is surprising for Linux. Uh, 18 for Mac OS. Um, also, the, um, the breakdown of PowerShell version itself, most people are actually still using 7.2. They haven't upgraded yet, shame, shame. Um, the um, uh, PowerShell 7.4, 65 million uh, nodes that are running that just in the last 90 days. Now, I, I don't know if this includes like all of the things that's in CI, CD, you know, and pipelines and things like it, it does. So yeah, um, Sean was just uh, confirming that it does include like all of that. So anything that you're running in, you know, GitHub page, uh, GitHub Actions, or or any other CI, uh, that's going to include those numbers. <clears throat> uh, so if you wanted to actually get, you know, uh, get that link, you could take a picture of this. Um, this will take you straight out to it. It's the, uh, I think. Uh, aka.ms slash and then ps github bi. And if anybody, I can leave it up just for a little bit longer. Yep. I started using these um, uh, last year and I found that they were quite, quite useful. Better than kind of trying to write down a, a URL, isn't it? Especially if you're going to have a URL this long. So QR codes for the win. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna like go through all the uh, all the steps on how to install PowerShell 7 everywhere because Microsoft did a good job, and by Microsoft I mean 
Sean Wheeler or somebody probably on his team. Uh, and um, he's, he's in the audience. Um, so like, yeah, you can install Windows, uh, sorry, PowerShell 7 on Windows with uh, MSI, Zip, the .NET Global Tool, uh, Winget. And uh, I've actually used uh, Jeff Hicks uh, PS release tools uh, quite a bit uh, to do that well, only on Windows. I think it doesn't install the uh, on any other uh, platform. But and then on Linux, you know, app get snap. Um, and then with if you're on Arch Linux, I think you got to do like an APK and some curl commands. Um, and on my Mac, I just use brew uh, pretty much all you know, the whole time to do the install. It's easy to update. Of course, you got to wait on the uh, uh, the package maintainers with uh, with Homebrew before you can, you know, inst you know, update, you know, install any updates. Um, so yeah, so um, again, I don't want to like go, you know, basically read a web page for you guys. So uh, this is not, by the way, uh, WP five one is not Word Perfect five one. Uh, this is, I think some of you guys got that. Uh, this is um, Windows PowerShell 5.1 versus PowerShell 7. Um, so if you scan that, you'll just go out to Microsoft's um, uh, documentation on the differences between those two. And um, yeah, so this one uh, is the differences between um, PowerShell 7 on Core versus, uh, sorry, PowerShell 7 on Windows versus any other, uh, any of the other platforms. I'll leave those up just for a couple of minutes. We good? So the next thing we need to talk about is uniqueness. <clears throat> um, uniqueness. I tried to to say that. I messed it up on the. Pronunciation. Anyway, so yeah, the um, if you're familiar with with Linux, they usually have like um, like a, the hashtag uh, pound symbol uh, tic tac toe, whatever you want to call it, slash, and then the um, the shell that the script is written for. Uh, for PowerShell, if uh, if you're going to use it without, if you're going to create a file. That you want to run without a PS1 extension, I think you need to include the uh, the, the hashtag um, exclamation mark, which I found out I guess was the magic numbers. What what Microsoft is calling it, I think back from the Linux days it was called a shebang, whatever. Um, yeah. So one thing about that is uh, that like that second bullet point there, it will create a new process and run within that process. So typically. You would include that for uh, for scripts like like maybe your primary script is a bash script, but you need to call some PowerShell from that, and then that script not having a PS1 extension, uh, it'll like spin up a brand new process for um, for the execution of that, and you can't share between um, you know your scope your script variables. You can't share between that and like the the others. Um, also, one of the things that I liked when I first started working with uh, PowerShell 7 um, was that I could just type in like ls to get a directory listing. I could type in you know cp and and a lot of the Linux commands that I was used to um, they put in uh, convenience aliases and um, with PowerShell actually that was PowerShell 5 well, Windows PowerShell I think yeah yeah and um, uh, <clears throat> with uh, on on Linux on Unix platforms and, and Mac platform, they have removed the convenience aliases. So you know, if you type ls, it's going to actually be ls from Linux and not an alias for git child item. Um, and that uh, I had a little point there to say that's a, uh, another reason to have your full commands in your scripts uh, and not the um, not using aliases. Um, yeah, and then the next thing is uh, we should talk about a, a case for case sensitivity. Um, file names, um, when you're executing them in, on the Linux side, you, they have to be uh, case sensitive. 
but tab completion is not case sensitive. And if you're not using tab completion, you're missing out on life. <laughs> um, you're worrying about exactly what you need to type in. Tab completion will, will save you a ton of time, usually, and um, also will help you sleep at night. Um, so the, uh, the get help and the import module are special cases in the fact that they are case insensitive. And so uh, with that, I want to thank you. And um, yeah, wait, are you kidding me? No, <laughs> yeah, actually, yes, I am kidding you. It's going to be demo time now. And uh, show time. <laughs> Did I fool anybody? Anybody? <laughs> Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is start up VS Code uh, Insider. That's why it's a green icon. And and the first thing I want to talk about is the path and environment. Um, one of the things. And my mouse, but don't have no room, no room for mouse. Um, the the pathing is definitely something that you have to handle differently. Like if we were to just take this, um, uh, you know, PS module path split, and then the semicolon, it, we'll, let's see what it let's see what it does. <clears throat> Starting Windows Terminal. Is that big enough for everybody? Yep. Okay, so we do the split and it works great. Okay, next. Um, I've got Ubuntu on here through the uh, Windows subsystem for Linux version 2. Which takes a little time to start. And then, oh, that didn't break it up at all, did it? Well, let's see about Windows PowerShell. Okay, obviously that worked. Okay, so looks like then Linux is going to use a different uh, separator. And, oh, hang on. Yikes. I was flipping around too much. All right, so that looks that looks good then. Um, but do you want to do you want to go through? I think I've got it over here. Yeah. So let's just do this. Let's create you know a little simple test. If it's Windows, then it's that. If it's not, then it's going to be the other. And we'll do this here. And that split very nicely. And over here. That split very nicely, and over here, and that split horribly, because obviously um, when uh, uh, the PS edition of desktop does not have an is um, is Windows, so well that's not exactly going to work. Uh, what's the thing? So maybe let's just kind of move it around, um, and. This will likely work. Let me get this other part too. So that worked splendidly. 
that works splendidly. And oh. and that worked quite well. Okay, but that's a bit of a mess, right? To go have to go through all of that every time you just want to split a path. Um, and so in comes the actual uh, .NET accelerator for system IO path, path separator. So now this is gonna work no matter where I run it, like magic. Um, so one of the things um, is gonna be a very um, common a common thing that I say is the, the .NET Accelerator, even though if you may not be uh, you know, a programmer or whatever, if you're writing any kind of code, you're really, you're really a developer. Um, but using the accelerators are gonna be so much easier if you're writing cross-platform PowerShell. Um, so yeah, I mean, so let's, let's kind of look at the next few um, uh, separators here. So uh, PowerShell 7 has got a directory separator car, um, char, uh, alt directory se separator, and I think that's how it works to uh, to be agnostic on which path whenever you're using, you know, actually put it in a, uh, uh, a file path to, to go and get something. And then the volume separator. Um, on this one, okay, so this is like everything is a slash. Um, I, I, I could make a reference to uh, Guns N' Roses, but I don't think I will. <laughs> Besides that. And then pretty much the same thing with uh, the Windows PowerShell, as in PowerShell 7 uh, on, on Windows. So um, I, again, we're gonna be seeing a lot of um, the .NET accelerators uh, in this. How's the, the lighting and all that, the size, everything is good? Okay, so uh, we, I started this conversation about the dollar home, um, which I thought was like a special folder. And um, so like here, are the special folders that I would assume would be in most Windows environments. We'll take a look. Yep, so that, that looks good. That's on Windows uh, PowerShell. And that's on PowerShell 7 on Windows. And let's just, for grins and giggles, run that over here. So there's going to be a lot of nothing. So, ooh, home. So we could maybe use home. But that, that tells you now that you can't use any of the environment variables that you have available to you on Windows platforms on, on Ubuntu. Uh, so the, uh, the thing that you can use is, well, let's just also see this environment home and see what that's about on here. So same thing. <clears throat> um, so for cross-platform, again, it's gonna be far better to, uh, to just maybe at the top of your profile or whatever to go ahead and set just a user profile and you could even add it to you know environment variable as long as you're not clobbering any of the other um, I mean like if um, like you couldn't do that on um, on Windows you'd have to call it something else besides user profile um, so if we do that and then we do user profile 
that's that's easy peasy. And then we do that. User profile, still the same thing, but now we have a common variable that we can use for the path. Okay. Um, Let's see what else. Yeah, and like, okay, application data and the local application data. Uh, we saw that, well, we'll you'll see uh, where this is kind of correlates to. Um, is this like thoroughly exciting, boring, or somewhere in between? Okay. <laughs> uh, so here we have on the Windows platform, using PowerShell 7 uh, app data lo uh, roaming and local. And for uh, Windows PowerShell, same thing, because it's the same platform. But we're gonna see something different in the uh, Unix side, the, the Ubuntu side, where now the, um, the application data is .config, and I think this might be like for sure the configuration for uh, PowerShell 7 lives in that .config folder. Um, and I think the modules live in the .local share uh, for, for, for uh, Linux and Mac OS. Uh, yes, I mean, you could add those to you know, like any variables you need, assign any um, um, environment variables if, if you wanted to use it you know, throughout. And let's maybe, uh, have you, has anybody ever written something that would just give you like a temporary file name, just like a random, you know, bunch of characters and stuff? Well, the uh, .NET accelerators have these already. Um, like, so there's a path there's a temp file name, which is gonna be a file name inside the temp path folder, and then a random file name that you can put anywhere you want. Uh, and obviously the, uh, the temp path is gonna be your you know, user path app data local temp, and that's gonna be the same for uh, PowerShell 7 as well. Yeah. Um, and a couple other things that you might want to use uh, in your scripts, maybe just for identification for logging or whatever, is uh, uh, the uh, OS version and the machine name. Uh, of course, you can always run like host name and you can get the same thing there. Uh, oh. Clara is not valid. So OS and machine name, and I think host name actually works here too. So host name might be, you know, okay to use cross platform, but I wouldn't, yes. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, and this, I don't know if the machine name is an object or a, um, just a string, looks like a string. Sorry. And of course the same thing is here. This is gonna be the exact same thing as the, as the other. Do anybody have? On the EvoTech blog, there's an interesting post about the effect of uh, get temp file name. Mm -hmm. uh, super useful command when you just need a, a real quick random you know file that's not going to collide with something. Um, but the side effect is that it actually creates the file, whether you use it or not. Like it's going to create this file. So if you call that method a lot, you're going to end up with a ton of files in your temp folder. So just be aware of that. 
it might make things slow if you accidentally generate a ton of temp files. Yeah, so generate a ton of temp files and just fill up your, your disk. And then, you, you know, if your um, uh, security is set so high where you can't log in, if your uh, disk drive is full, then you're, 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 you're golden, right? <laughs> it's time to go home. But yeah, uh, thanks for calling that out. Um, that was um, uh, uh, EvoTech blog post about the effects of um, the uh, get temp file name. Um, do you know if it does the same like with the get random file name? So no, that's just return the string. Do, random file name is the same. It doesn't create it. It don't generate. Okay, so the random random file name only creates a name. The uh, get temp file name actually creates the thing, even though you were just wanting a file name. Okay. Yes. I think so. Um, and let's. Uh, okay. Yeah. So there's no overloads for that. So you're going to get. Whatever, whatever's there. I was wondering if there was any overloads. So an overload lets you uh, specify essentially parameters in your, um, um, you know, for your uh, either method or your uh, static property, which I think this is uh, maybe. Um, yeah. So um, that's it for special folders. Uh, now for environment variables. Um, so, you know, everybody knows how to look at their environment variable. This is one way. Yeah. And Sorry, first time with tabs. Not really. So that's a lot different than what I'm seeing over here. Um, also, I don't see like there's a um, this. Posh Summit, sorry, uh, PS Summit Demo 3. Um, that guy's sitting out there, and that's actually a machine level, machine uh, system level variable. So we'll see that when I run that over here as well on the PowerShell 7 on, on Windows. Um, so uh, to set a variable, you can just set, a, uh, set it any old way. This will work for pretty much all of them. I mean, it's going to work for all of them. Um, and then I do this, and we see now there's a demo one. This is session only, so it'll, it'll die if you don't do something to, to keep it around. Um, And there we see the, the Summit Demo 1. And over here, and we see the Demo 1 and 2. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, if you wanted to set it uh, permanently for the, uh, for the current user, you could use the uh, set environment variable. And if I look there, where did it go? Because I have not reloaded yet. Uh, so now let me just reload the Windows PowerShell. And hopefully, um, I will be, that will be uh, there when I do the, do this. And we see the two. And, 
Yeah, it's gonna be the same thing for that. I might like restart for that. Um, the other thing, if you wanted to have a uh, set the variable for a machine, um, there's another command for that. And oh, um, actually another enum that you have to use for that. But I'm not gonna do that because it does require an elevated, uh, ele elevated permissions. And um, I think, uh, so there's, the, there's more. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, um, like importing uh, some functions. And so if we do just this, and this was, There we go. So I'm dot sourcing that, which I think it did uh, import my module, my PS, PSM1 module. Yeah, all right. So get file encoding is something that, I, that is in that uh, PSM1. And um, uh, since we're here, we can just do do that. So I'm going to do the get file encoding and the path for this. Uh, this particular file is this file is actually UTF-16 um, LE, I guess a little Indian um, uh, encoding, and the, seek, the end of line is uh, line feed. And if we were to check the get line ending with the same thing, we'll see that that line feed is uh, specific to Linux and Unix. Now, most of the time, I don't have to mess with that because VS Code is like kind of agnostic. It just does things for you. And um, uh, yeah, so that's the engine. I know I'm, I kinda might be close to coming up on a little bit of some time, uh, but I did want to just kind of show you uh, like one way that you could um, I've also got this U name. Let me just show you that real quick. Um, so if we do get U, oh, I didn't, yeah, I did. All right, so this is actually using the command U name. This was a, um, um, huh? no, no, uh -huh. this is, this is a, uh, function that I wrote for uh, one of the iron scripters. Uh, and I just kind of did some, a bunch of horrible stuff with it. <laughs> um, and, and speaking of, um, like what if, um, hang on. what if I wanted to do like a computer, um, like on the Windows platforms, Actually, computer info. Oh, anybody know that you could do any command that is um, a git command? You can omit git. It, yeah. I wouldn't suggest doing it. It's just like a like a trick um, kind of thing. There's a lot of problems with it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because it, it has to exhaust all possibilities before it then falls back and tries with like an injective So it's going to be very Yeah, it, it's basically going through your entire path to see if that exists. Right. Yeah, it's the last fallback, right? Try that with process. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe later. <laughs> uh, not going to try that with process. Uh, but let's say that you had a, um, a, a command that you know works in Windows but you want something that's gonna work in um, uh, like Linux or Mac, you could set an alias for that command. Now, this is a horrible, horrible, very horrible example of that. Um, the main reason why it's a horrible example is because the, uh, the git computer info and the git uname commands, they don't have the same, um, the same parameters and they don't output the same thing. So. Uh, any uh, time you decide you know, to want to include something like this, 
And I'll, I'll give you a, a prime example of what I did. Um, I had a, um, a module called uh, Posh Dyn DNS. It was uh, uh, a client for the Dyn managed DNS service. And in it, I had this, uh, uh, I had like, I wrote two commands, one for Windows and one for, well, one for uh, desktop edition and one for core edition. And um, uh, I used this, um, this boot, you know, this uh, conditional to, to set an alias for the actual command that I was going to be using based on the platform. So this is a real cool work, workaround. But again, your, um, um, the, the parameters need to be identical for it to really be worthwhile. Uh, so if we were to do a compare between the core and this, and we look, so we see, you know, besides the type for the method, um, all those are the same there, and we keep going down, and then all of the parameters are exactly the same, again, except for the type for that. Um, and that's because the core didn't have like the web request method for the Win Microsoft PowerShell commands. And yeah, so that's, um, that's that. Uh, anybody have any questions on that? I'm kind of trying to speed things up to get, get to the end. Um, this is uh, the Posh Dyn DNS API is in my GitHub. It's an archived uh, public, uh, public repo. You can go out there and take a look to see how I did it. And mostly I did it because I wanted, was the, the web commandlets uh, between, uh, between, you know, uh, uh, core and desktop, quite different. And I wanted to have some specific output. Um, the other thing, um, I guess I'll get to, okay, so did anybody notice that my, um, uh, whenever I start one of these up, and I start another one up, so all of these, Basically, say, you know, the um, uh, the logo, which is the PowerShell 741. Then I have that PowerShell profile script. This is what's actually running, um, and then that is running uh, the multi-platform profile PS1 that I have in in this folder. So every one of these is running the exact same. Like like, there's just a stub that runs the the one that is the multi-platform profile. Um, and you can see like the posh is a different version. The um, read, read line is a different version. Um, yeah, and I probably don't have time to go deep into that. Um, but essentially, I just did a lot of checks and because like the PS read line doesn't support um, like the prediction, prediction source and the prediction view style in, um, in Windows, I had to like do things special for that. Um, so I, I think that's that for the demo. And I will get back to our regularly scheduled program. Oh yeah, you already know. Okay, so if you're interested in learning more about uh, or seeing PowerShell run on Linux. Here are some other um, uh, other presentations that that are specific with Linux and and PowerShell. Uh, so the next one's at uh, three fifteen for James Brundage. Tomorrow two for Stephen Judd. Um, Wednesday four fifteen Sydney Smith, and and so on. Um, so. With that, I want to say thank you. And before, like, one guy already left, but I, I'm going to go track him down. Do, do, your, do, do your feedback, please, for this. Um, it, was, uh, it was a pleasure to be able to present. And um, 
I hope you guys learned, I hope everybody learned something. And uh, I know I did with the uh, uh, temp file. So 